Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Health Tech with Purpose. Today we are broadcasting from HLTH, Europe's most popular healthcare technology event. We are thrilled to have Eduardo and Mariana from Uphill Health joining us on our show. Uphill Health is the leading care orchestration platform dedicated to increasing hospital capacity to meet demand by automating best practice clinical pathways. Their mission is to empower individuals to provide and receive the best possible care. Join us for this exciting discussion as Eduardo and Mariana share their insights and experiences in transforming the care journey. Hello, Eduardo and Mariana. Glad to see you at HIMSS. And, um, you know, at HIMSS, I'm always um, super excited to see all the innovation that is happening in health. You know, um, sometimes I fact get overwhelmed a bit, to be honest, <laughs> uh, meeting all the great companies. Uh, but glad uh, to know more about Uphill. And I thought that it would be super interesting to take this story to our audience. And um, let's talk about Uphill. So let's start with you, Eduardo. Tell us more about Uphill and your tool. Sure. So we are a care orchestration platform. So essentially, we automate clinical pathways for providers. And by doing that, we increase the capacity of that hospital or clinic to serve more patients, which is very aligned with health systems are needing right now in terms of capacity shortages mm-hmm. due to essentially workforce struggles that many countries are seeing worldwide. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, by increasing capacity, of course, we are decreasing waiting times, waiting lists, and this impacts greatly also patients' outcomes, which is key when we're talking about healthcare. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, would you like to go a bit more deeper um, into helping us understand the role of uphill in a hospital setting? Maybe uh, just give a bit more imagination, if you can. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, so uh, as what we were talking about uh, care integration, so Appeal's approach is an approach that is a process based care orchestration approach. So what we do is that the software acts like a second layer, as a background layer to the EHR, so to the electronic health record, where we, uh, bounded by a clinical pathway that is based on evidence, internal protocols, are automating tasks that must happen within this best practices perspective. So what happens is that based on events that already happen on the EHR, Mm -hmm. there are triggers to our platform that automate actions to the healthcare professional, and that's where we actually save a lot of time Mm-hmm. and ensure that the best practices are being uh, implemented. So mm-hmm. like automating clinical and administrative tests. So a good example would be, for example, uh, diabetic patients. And once mm-hmm. we connect through interoperability with the electronic health record system or the broker underlying that electronic health record system, we're able to identify patients that are diabetic and are in risk uh, of, for example, complications of diabetes. We enroll them in a clinical pathway automatically. And that clinical pathway can do many things for that healthcare team, such as, for example, routinely prescribing um, follow-up exams and tests that the patient can do. Mm-hmm. The results are then imported back to the system, and that is a trigger for, for example, anticipating an appointment earlier on, or uh, even at the same time, adjusting therapy through decision-making for the healthcare teams. And so essentially what we're doing is, in the first time, bridging the gap between appointments and different levels of care, for example, from primary care to secondary care to home care, Mm -hmm. as well as speeding up the processes of these Mm -hmm. clinical pathways inside the hospital. And it's typically the benefit results in removal of what we call low-value clinical tasks Mm -hmm. from uh, the heads of of, uh, clinicians so that they can focus on high-risk patients, they can focus on complex management, Mm -hmm. like complex diagnosis, complex workups for patients. Because we have actually nowadays healthcare resources that are highly valuable, all of them are of course, but even their time costs a lot of money and we have them like spending 30% of their time in these low value tasks. So this is time where they could be seeing more patients and that's how we do increase the capacity. Right, right. So Eduardo, um, uh, you know, you have been a provider yourself uh, Mm -hmm. in the past life. So, um, you know, what was that aha moment that you thought about building something uh, like uphill. In fact, um, I would also like to hear a story about the name uphill. I mean, <laughs> yeah, sure. Th- they're tied word. together, actually. These two, these two questions. Well, um, I was very interested uh, in medicine. That's why I, I, I went to medical school um, because I wanted to know how uh, the human body worked, right? 
So, uh, and what I found out actually is that um, there's huge information asymmetry in the healthcare space, mm -hmm. much like any other sector where liberal professionals uh, are the ones that essentially define that, that space, um, and that most of it was tied on how to manage uh, disease, right. essentially the initial workup, diagnosis, stratification, treatment lines, and so on, and follow-up. And uh, uh, in terms of the system itself, if you went to a hospital, it was chaos everywhere. Mm -hmm. like, and I've been fortunate enough to work in Portugal and other countries as well um, and have seen uh, the same story over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so what we started to think was, can we mm -hmm. essentially externalize this knowledge to a platform mm -hmm. that would be able to help physicians, mm -hmm. not like ESRs that are typically just there for record taking and information access, but actually knowledge systems that can help the physician decide and help them manage right. disease over right. time. And so um, I had a background in clinical research, which gave me a lot of knowledge in terms of um, evidence-based medicine, as well as to assess medical interventions. And hence the logo, which okay. is a triangle mm -hmm. with a, a dot uh, climbing the, the, the mountain. So the name actually came from the evidence pyramid. There's this symbol in evidence-based medicine which states that um, high-level clinical evidence, high-quality clinical evidence is at the top of okay. this triangle um, and those are essentially what we call evidence-based decision support systems mm -hmm. and those are built on top of all the evidence that was generated by the medical field from simple case studies to systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And so um, the idea of the logo and the name Uphill mm -hmm. is to bring the teams through this, which we know is a hardless and strenuous challenge of moving from the status where they have fragmented care, they don't have specific externalization of knowledge they can rely on, into a best practice approach that's streamlined and embedded within the systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so also because uh, we um, were founded uh, at the hillside of the biggest oh, mountain, mountain in, in <laughs> Portugal. <Okay. laughs> so that also was, was an interesting one. What was the idea incepted while you were going uphill? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, great. And, and I and they say, like, um, the name is the best, whatever gets you meetings. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, <laughs> if true. it sticks, then it's good. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Mariana, um, since you are, uh, you know, managing more the uh, marketing and the uh, go-to-market side mm -hmm. of Uphill, uh, tell us more about, uh, you know, your experiences of uh, dealing with hospitals and, uh, uh, you know, like, is this a problem that uh, hospitals recognize and yes. uh, uh, understand or they are still ignorant and they are happy in their own uh, mm -hmm. shell that you know this is how we do it mm -hmm. we have been doing it how has been the market okay okay um, I mean it's different from hospital to hospital for if we're talking about the public sector or the private private care sector uh, when we're talking about the public sector the pains that we see the most are what just it what I say a couple minutes ago like medical shortages the lack of capacity this mm -hmm. struggling to meet the needs uh, that are increasing um, so they do recognize the pain of the lack of capacity and we are not increasing exponentially the number of resources we have available so they, they do recognize they need technology mm -hmm. to help them with that increase the capacity leverage their knowledge uh, through technology um, the private sector is a little bit different mm -hmm. because the focus might be more related to um, quality experience yeah. nonetheless cost optimization exactly yeah. cost efficiency so this also impacts because if they increase the efficiency of their teams they right. decrease costs and they can see more patients mm -hmm. so that that's definitely something they do feel like they, 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 they need. Yes. I think that um, you cannot solve an exponential problem with linear solution. Right. And I think that most governments and provider groups are trying to keep up with demands by bringing more doctors and nurses yep. in. Um, but that just won't cut it. Because we have an exponential problem that is growing on top of aging populations, chronic diseases. Chronic mm -hmm. diseases are now diagnosed early on. Mm -hmm. Chronic diseases that have 
complex therapies to be managed. Mm -hmm. You have the wellness and healthcare being blended together, so there is no differentiation. Uh, no more and on top of all of these you have emergent diseases like COVID and so mm -hmm. it's just completely unable for providers to keep up with this and so um, the thing is they don't feel the pain points this way let me tell you a quick example yeah. for example heart failure patients they now should have the dosage of the drugs curated mm -hmm. to the maximum dosages mm -hmm. in just a few weeks time mm -hmm. If not, symptoms are going to persist and they will end up in the ER. Right. Every hospital that we work with has struggled with keeping up with the man in the ER, mm -hmm. but they cannot afford to have multiple cardiology or medicine appointments with these patients like every three days right. just to curate the dosage of a drug. Okay. But if you build a clinical pathway that assesses symptoms automatically, builds on top of healthcare data right. coming from platforms, right. and suggests healthcare teams to do rate those, even remotely, right. even nurses can do it right. um, remotely based on a protocol that has been consensualized mm -hmm. with medical doctors. And so you're able to get those patients to maximum dose on time, if they need it, right. and then prevent rehospitalization and ER admissions. Okay. And it's very good example that that touches a touch point that they mm -hmm. have and a need that they have mm -hmm. um, in a very simple way yeah. in a trivial way and that has direct impact yeah. in, in okay. their day-to-day -day life yeah. okay. and um, you know when you talk about um, uh, you know being able to find those touch points so uh, for uphill like uh, is this data that resides in the hospital system like a EHR or you're also capturing data that resides say on a patient's personal device or outside the hospital? Yeah. I mean, we're doing both. Mm -hmm. uh, there are several ways to input data in this care journey. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the EHR is fundamental. That's mm -hmm. why we are such yeah. integrated, integrated with them, so integrated with them. But there's also the channel between the hospital and the patient that's also fundamental because mm -hmm. if the patient is home, we need data regarding the patient mm -hmm. when the patient is home, changes in signs and symptoms, for example. Uh, so yeah, we do also keep, we, we give the hospital mm -hmm. the possibility to have that direct channel with the patient to input data in their, their journey. Yeah, yeah that we do it that way and think about everything we do at Uphill, mm -hmm. essentially what we advocate as being journey-based care mm -hmm. is this idea that you should start with the clinical pathway and then the data requirements will come from the clinical pathway. Mm -hmm. So you know that to treat and diagnose colorectal cancer, you need data from colonoscopies, you need data from lab yeah. results, you need data from CT scans and MRIs. So we don't have... a one size fits all in terms of interoperability approach mm -hmm. uh, because the data is minimized depending on the pathways that yeah. are run in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so that isn't things in terms of interoperability and in terms of change management and data privacy for patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also in the patient's perspective, we are the least disruptive we, mm -hmm. we, we can be. So there's no patient app developed mm -hmm. by us. We use mm -hmm. channels that are known to the patient, mm -hmm. like okay. phone calls, text messages, emails, etc. Yes, today, many providers, I think most of the providers have already set up call centers and apps and web portals. Yeah. And so they have all the stack. Right. They just don't have the intelligence to use that stack right. in favor of the patient. Right providing that knowledge that is yeah. about the management. Bu building tech is easy. Building intelligence is rather exactly. tough. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and when you merge both, yeah. the value is just way more relevant for right. physicians. And I think that in everything we do, we see it from the lens of clinicians. Mm -hmm. So they always ask, and I think it's a fundamental question, is this tech going to improve outcomes? Or is it just going to be incremental? Yeah. And if we think about ambient AI, newer technologies, um, we get excited about it, but um, in the end, if you're just recognizing speech and putting that into a note, that will be incremental for the patient journey. That will not right. change the, the outcomes, the health outcomes for that patient in particular. So, um, Eduardo, a question to you since, um, you know, you had your journey, like, from being a physician to, um, you know, becoming an entrepreneur and, you know, a lot of our audience 
has this question like uh, you know especially for a health startup like you know finding your first customer mm-hmm. or getting your thesis right early on for example convincing mm-hmm. a health system a larger health system to use the product like you know mm-hmm. um, it's always hard so uh, how was uh, that experience for you and how did you crack the early code um, you know to be able to get yourself um, in into those early customers those early wins This episode of Health Tech with Purpose podcast is brought to you by Mind Pauser, a product engineering and digital transformation company focused on health. At Mind Pauser, we enable health companies to build the future of health where accessible, equitable, and patient care. We strongly believe that technology can empower a healthier world, and that's why we are partnering with healthcare experts like yours to make it happen. Hi guys, thanks for listening to Health Tech with Purpose. Make sure to subscribe us on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube for more expert insights on industry innovation and transformation. And remember, share the knowledge. It's a strenuous journey. Um but and I, the courage, of yeah, course. Yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. I think it's uh, it's it's all about courage and, and some persistence. But I think um you just have to assume ideas don't matter and it's all about iteration. So for example, we started aiming to this knowledge or this asymmetry of knowledge and information in terms of the best practices and we started with a product that was directed to training physicians okay but we found out earlier on that they didn't want to be trained that frequently and that training didn't have the retention that we expected so, so training we, about care is, yeah okay and so we developed a decision support system mm-hmm. you know, essentially we're expecting physicians to go there and follow the best practices mm-hmm. and we understood very rapidly that they don't want to do that they don't have time to do that in the point at the point of care so we we essentially discovered the thesis that in order to increase compliance with best practices you need to provide productivity value for the physician mm-hmm. um and that comes through automation at the same time we're all seeing we're also complying or assuming that the path is going to be complied with um and so i think that the the two lessons i can take from this journey at this point is the need for iterating the idea into product and i mm-hmm. think the faster the iteration is the more successful the product will be and uh, the second is which essentially challenges the first one but is the note that solutions in healthcare cannot be half baked mm-hmm. you need to have a full fledged solution that ticks all the boxes mm-hmm. in order for right, it to be successful right, right. as you've lost uh, your custom prospect for life like exactly. it is exactly <laughs> and i think that there are many companies in the digital health space that uh, have this approach is a agile approach um, about testing something that has a core feature but has nothing around it it has no interoperability it has no safety safeguards um and it has no compliance with the standards mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. and that is a risk mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so mariana since um um you know you you are someone who has the pulse of the market like you know what's happening so over the years um uh, you know like as an outsider i hear a lot of uh, um you know renaissance and revolution going in the european healthcare but uh, as a um, provider uh, of a software mm-hmm. do you see that on the ground uh, like have you seen the attitude changing towards technology by the hospitals yes, and yes, um, yes. you know how have I you mean, seen that we see that nationally at a european level there are initiatives digitalization interoperability etc mm-hmm. i think um, our approach as always or almost always been like a step further mm-hmm. so we've been told quite often even here at hims that we are in the future mm-hmm. uh but the 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 thing is that we do have the results in the present uh, mm-hmm. and we are has it has it met- become easier to crack a deal uh, oh, yeah, i mean sure. yes yeah. yes when, once you start having results once yeah. you start mm-hmm. showing that mm-hmm. this impacts not only health efficiency uh, health teams efficiency but also patient outcomes in a major way mm-hmm. of course they do want that and even patients they feel more accompanied by the hospital so mm-hmm. yes it is it is and fundamental think, and, and i think that um there has been historically an approach from providers to develop their own solutions mm-hmm. um but the pressure that clinicians themselves and patients are putting in IT mm-hmm. teams from healthcare groups um 
major systems and simple providers and clinics uh, is completely impossible to manage internally. And the systems require compliance as a medical device, uh, cybersecurity compliance, and so on and so forth. And, and so I think that providers have been more uh, willing to experiment and to buy solutions from providers that are actually showing that mm -hmm. they are able to move the needle in terms of outcomes mm -hmm. and, and yeah. cost efficiency. Then there's also the different the, the difference when it comes to technological providers that we see a lot with or without AI that they specialize in a specific part of mm -hmm. a journey, for example, like mm -hmm. only the post-discharge part of the journey right. or only on oncological uh, clinical pathways, something like this. So mm -hmm. they do not have as much of an integrated perspective of mm -hmm. the entire journey of a patient within a system, within mm -hmm. a hospital. I mean, a patient that has heart failure can also go to surgery for another reason. So right. this mm -hmm. should be a perspective. Yeah. A hospital should have a single perspective of, yeah. a, of, of the patient across different pathways. And if costs are mounting just for drugs, right. if you have the same perspective right. for technology, yeah. it's just impossible to keep the sustainability yeah. of healthcare systems as well. And also limits a lot the scalability of the mm -hmm. solutions, uh -huh. especially if we're talking about the public sector. If you develop something specific for a hospital, right. but you want to have it nationwide, it probably won't fit the same way mm -hmm. in all hospitals. Right. So the scalability, the interoperability is, is key. Yeah. Right. And what about AI? So has that made life easy or difficult or both maybe you know there could be different contexts like where it has made life easy and where it has made life I think difficult. that AI has actually um, broadened the horizon of uh, decision makers mm -hmm. I think that was the first advantage not even a technical one for us and for them because they just they were conf confronted with the speed that technology is taking mm -hmm. um, and that they cannot hide it under the rug Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has actually contributed to an easier go-to-market. Okay. The thing about AI in practice, you use it a lot internally in terms of uh, communication channels, building pathways, yeah. iterating the pathways, but I think that hospitals are also falling into other extreme, which is now let us put generative AI everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, if you think about it, if you have generative AI in each step of the way, this has a compounding effect on mm -hmm. the risk. Right. And that's why we go back to basics and we think about clinical pathways. Mm -hmm. Define your journeys first right. and understand where AI can be leveraged right. and the perimeter of safety for specific models, that being clinical models or operational yeah. models. And then you are taking a deliberate approach to AI and you're just owning a hospital and AI is coming from the windows and all the doors in and you're not controlling it and you're not controlling the effects for right. patients. Yeah. Anything you want to add? No, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's fundamental to have this clinical pathway and evidence, of course, bounding all the recommendations and suggestions Gen AI may give to healthcare professionals, for example. Yeah, so right. back to basics. So when you say easy, uh, like it makes uh, an easy go to market, um, do you feel that it also increases the competition? Because now probably like more people can claim, mm -hmm. you know, building that solution. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Uh, like the intelligence piece, like you mentioned, yeah. you know, yeah, no, yeah. more people can say that they have that intelligence I think, available. Yeah, I think that um, it, it's, it, I think the overlap and saturation of the market is happening, but I think more and more providers have been um, willing to take a second look and to separate what is a claim with generative AI than what is an actual model and an actual approach that has results proven and scientifically tested. And we need to think about um, medicine, like m medical decision making has been always based on evidence or uh, epidemiological evidence. And epidemiological evidence, either you want it or not, is mostly based on models that are um, classic models. And so this idea that we'll have personalized uh, completely black boxed models to decide every single step is just not something that you can translate into day to day practice and so we need to really understand how it fits the workflow um, and we are very well positioned in doing so rather than just uh, uh, 
point of care solution that does a specific stratification for a specific disease or an incremental approach in terms of note taking or some other operational mm -hmm. and admin uh, yeah. uh, strategy. But I mean, the bigger you get on the market, of course, the, the, the more competition you'll see uh, when it comes to, to solutions. But I think there are some key characteristics what, where Uphill actually has a lot of advantage, whether it comes um, with the interoperability, with mm -hmm. the clinical knowledge that we do provide, and it saves like two to three years to health teams on care mapping, whether it's regarding certifications when it comes to medical device compliance, because mm -hmm. With AI or not, as I said before, mm -hmm. there are some sort of certifications and regulations that you must comply with to be able to, for example, automate clinical tasks. Mm -hmm. So this is these are some of the characteristics we see that we are a step further. I think it's all about execution, right? It's all about uh, having a clear success story out of the claim that you're that you're making, and what we've seen with our customers that. They are exposed to many solutions that oh, we have this AI model that does this specific task, but then you have to implement it, you have to train the professionals, you have to include it in the workflow, you have to certify it from a security standpoint, from a uh, medical device standpoint. And so all of this burden is being shifted towards the provider, and so they are leaning more towards solutions that are wall to wall rather than just these point solutions yeah. uh, where they have to manage everything yeah. right right so what are the next trends um, that each of you are excited about in patient care so you know what is something that makes you feel excited that okay wow this is going to happen <laughs> care integration so, uh, yeah. and self-effectiveness for the patients uh, and efficacy for the patient so i think that, um in throughout the world, we're seeing a movement towards care integration, mm -hmm. and some com some countries have been able to execute it. And by care integration, I mean having a unified journey that is uninterrupted throughout the continuum of care. Mm -hmm. Some countries have been integrating vertically hospitals with primary care centers. Some others have been integrating them horizontally. Um, but what we've seen is that the benefits of having the right patient at the right level of care in terms yeah. of sustainability are huge. Mm -hmm. We're having trivial stuff being treated in high complexity hospitals with mm -hmm. very much the most differentiated resources and personnel there is in the world, and this is completely unbearable. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that we can place, we can have a radar that places the patient at the right time in the right level of care is essential for us to optimize the sustainability of healthcare. AI is going to have a huge role in this in terms of risk stratification. Clinical pathways are going to have a major role in this in terms of connecting all the touch points across different providers, and I'm super excited with it. We've seen, for example, in the US, the multiplication of virtual care applications and solutions, and that itself is just fragmenting more and more and more care that is provided. It's increasing access, but at the same time, is fragmenting the healthcare system. So we do also need to have the glue for all those applications in terms of the single clinical pathway. It can be shared by the patient, known by the patient, accessible with the um, tools that the physicians already have, and that is super important. And also this will allow the patient itself to have more power and to be more empowered to execute uh, yeah. its own journey. Yeah, I think from the, from the patient's perspective, as younger generations get older, I think uh, they're more capable of also distinguishing what are the interactions, hybridization of care, digitalization, etc., that actually contribute for their progress on mm -hmm. their care journey and mm -hmm. what's not really that relevant mm -hmm. and not... Take control. Mm -hmm. Yes, that doesn't really provide a resolution to mm -hmm. their need for care. So right. they, I, I think we're being more, more and more capable of distinguishing when to be engaged. And, yeah. right. actually and uh, one last question for both of you. Um, like, what is something that surprised you in this journey um, by surprise I mean that something that you assumed that this is how it works or this is how people think or whatever and then you know um, during your own learnings you figure mm -hmm. that okay I was wrong was. <laughs> I think one thing or probably the thing that surprised me the most was in healthcare IT 
doctors are the enemies. They're always the enemies. Like they're seen <laughs> as the blockers. They're seen as the ones who can pause an enormous project of digitization. But what I've come to learn is that actually that's not true. Mm -hmm. Doctors, yeah. when they are, their doctors are protecting their patients from useless stuff. Yeah, cut the noise. Yeah, and uh, once they are convinced you know you have a good product mm -hmm. and, and they will defend that product mm -hmm. until yes. the last minute. And so um, that's one thing, that, and I'm a doctor and I always seen my colleagues and I as, as some sort of blockers to, to new technologies. And in the end, I understood why. Uh, it's just need to, to cut all the noise and, and yeah. just let pass what's really useful for the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also when it comes to project implementations, we know the doctors just don't really have much time, not even for their patients, <laughs> rather um, for technolo technological implementations, they wouldn't even, even have less uh, time. So it's important to shift this weight of project mm -hmm. implementation, this clinical processes, all the information we should be able to provide them like ready in the mm -hmm. beginning of mm -hmm. the project and not take more of their time when it yeah. comes We've to We've seen it. with our customers projects that have been going on for years yeah. mm -hmm. and haven't reached a, a go live. Um, it's, it's, it's very strenuous for them and, uh, and I think that it's, um, I think in the end when the product is good, mm -hmm. um, they will be the champions uh, mm -hmm. moving that product towards uh, the hospital from simple implementations to wall to wall implementations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana <laughs> and Eduardo, you. for uh, these thoughts. And I believe that that's, that goes a long way in helping our audience learn about building a product around patient experience and better delivery of care. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on the Health Tech with Purpose podcast. Before you leave, make sure to like and subscribe on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. And if you would like to see someone on this podcast, do refer to us. My contact details are in the description. Before I leave, I wish you stay healthy, stay curious, and keep building.